Have you ever seen a juggler juggle 25 milk bottles? How did he ever get to do that? The answer is he started with one bottle, then two, then three, and just kept doing it, and pretty soon he was at 25. And that's the way we did it. So basically, we started out with cash and ended up buying a bunch of businesses, including insurance companies. Insurance is, in itself, a profitable business, but it has the additional advantage of creating something that's called float. And float is the money that hangs around Berkshire while a claim is waiting to be paid. And Warren turned out to have a extraordinary ability to use the money thrown off by the float to buy companies that fed the growth of Berkshire. In 1983, Mrs. B cashed in on her business by selling control for $55 million to a company owned by investor Warren Buffett. Warren was quite an expert about newspapers. He got interested in the Post because he recognized it as a greatly undervalued company. He had to write me a letter, dear Mrs. Graham, I've just bought 5% of your company, and I mean you no harm. And I think it's a great company. I know it's Graham owned and Graham run, and that's fine with me. And I thought, whoa, this guy's really terrific. He used to come to board meetings with about 20 annual reports. And he would take me through these annual reports. I mean, it was like going to business school with Warren Buffett. Kay Graham did introduce Warren to the world of Washington, an entirely different group than he had ever dealt with before. It was clear that working with Kay gave him a different kind of confidence, and he was the star. Everyone wants to hear what Warren Buffett has to say. The Oracle of Omaha, building his image and having some fun. Berkshire shares have increased more than 2,000% in value, one of the largest market capitalizations in the world, and it could grow a lot larger since Warren Buffett shows no sign of slowing down. So how did he do it? By investing in what he knows and understands. Good old-fashioned American brands like Coca-Cola, Fruit of the Loom, and Dairy Queen. What inspired you? I'm this inspired me. Find <laughs> what you like. Is that what yeah, you're absolutely. Today, the Coca-Cola company will sell almost 2 billion 8-ounce servings of one form or another of Coca-Cola products. Now, if you get an extra penny a day, a penny a serving, that's $20 million a day. That's $7.3 billion a year from one penny more. When you own Coca-Cola, you own a little piece of the minds of billions and billions of people. That is really good. Who's got the most $100 bills these days? Well, his name is Warren Buffett in this country, and he has just displaced his friend Bill Gates as the richest businessman in the world. And the purpose of Wednesday's meeting was to discuss Buffett's company, Berkshire Hathaway's plan to purchase railroad giant Burlington Northern. Valued at $26 billion, this would be Buffett's largest acquisition ever. He's created Berkshire from virtually nothing into hundreds of billions of dollars of market cap. Nobody else has a record like that. He wanted to have an outstanding reputation that he never really upset the apple cart when he bought a business, that he kept the management in place. He was establishing a reputation that paid off later in life. It's been building and building ever since I've known him. I was genetically blessed with a certain wiring that's very useful in a highly developed market system where there's lots of chips on the table, and uh, you know I happen to be good at that game. Ted Williams wrote a book called The Science of Hitting, and in it he had a uh, picture of himself at bat and the strike zone broken into, I think, 77 squares. And he said if he waited for the pitch that was really in a sweet spot, he would bat 400, and if he had to swing at something on the lower corner, he would probably bat 235. And in investing, I'm in a no-called strike business, which is the best business you can be in. 
I can look at a thousand different companies and I don't have to be right on every one of them or even 50 of them. So I can pick the ball I want to hit. And the trick in investing is just to sit there and watch pitch after pitch go by and wait for the one right in your sweet spot. And if people are yelling, swing you bum, ignore them. There's a temptation for people to act far too frequently in stocks simply because they're so liquid. Over the years, you develop a lot of filters. And I do know what I call my circle of competence. So I, I, I stay within that circle and I don't worry about things that are outside that circle. Defining what your game is, where you're going to have an edge is enormously important. He truly loves to do what he does. I think investors who own Berkshire Hathaway, they see themselves as a part of a community. There are more long-term holders of Berkshire than any company. People consider it a religion. They don't buy it with the idea they're gonna sell it next week. I think most of them buy it with the intent of holding it for their lifetime, just like they'd buy a farm or buy an apartment house. At Berkshire, everybody gets the same information from the comprehensive annual report. We don't meet with the analysts. I'm not interested in what an analyst thinks about Berkshire. I'm interested in what the owners of Berkshire think about Berkshire. He came out of a private partnership where people he knew were trusting him. And he had his relatives in the partnership, and they were not rich. And as it got bigger, started treating everybody else the way he treated his relatives. In terms of our feeling toward the people who are shareholders, we regard them as our partners. They're not some faceless group of people. And that's why at the annual meeting, you know, I love seeing 40,000 of them. It gives real meaning to what we're doing every day.